the arms deal whistleblowers, you've been very vocal as I've just mentioned. Maybe a starting point for this conversation is for you to draw a comparison for us as to how close the public and the private sector is connected, um, how narrow that nexus is. Absolutely. I think that um, to understand the industry, one needs to understand that the two are in an almost symbiotic relationship. So the weapons makers facilitating organizations such as banks, um, who obviously fund these huge deals, and governments, but governments in the broadest term. So it's, it's not just the obvious elements of government like the military and intelligence services, but individual politicians, political parties. These companies are huge contributors to political campaigns and a lot of the bribes in arms deals find their way into election campaigns. So the links are really profound, but these links happen not only in the lead up to and during the conclusion of a deal, but also after that deal. So governments ensure that those involved in the trade, be they the executives of the arms companies who are involved in the corruption, be they the politicians from foreign countries who enable this corruption, or be they the intermediaries or local people involved in the corruption, the governments tend to ensure that these people never face the legal consequences of their actions. And this is seen, for instance, in the reality that of the 502 violations of UN arms embargoes, only two have ever resulted in any legal action whatsoever. So what does it come down to to break that symbiotic link that you refer to? Is it courageous whistleblowers? Is it better legislation? Uh, what is it? Unfortunately, the answer isn't in, in legislation, which is where it should be. Um, the reality is that what we lack in countries around the world, this is not a South African issue. The United Kingdom is one of the biggest corruptors of other countries through arms deals. What we lack is political will. We have some very good laws and legislation, but unfortunately, politicians are simply not interested in ensuring that that legislation is properly enforced. So what is needed is, first of all, the exposure of this information as widely as possible. And of course, to do that, one needs to have brave, courageous whistleblowers at all stages of these arms deals. Is there uh, enough global cooperation in this uh, respect? Or, uh, as you've suggested, there, there, there's so much uh, uh, conflict or, or, or similarity of interest that uh, it, it, it doesn't uh, help anybody to, uh, uh, to cooperate too closely across borders. There really isn't um, sufficient international cooperation. And here I think there's even a degree of nationalism or patriotism amongst prosecutors and investigators. So in the South African case, the South African arms deal, the UK serious fraud office settled with the British company involved in the corruption BAE systems. They settled with them and gave them a fine of half a million pounds on about eight or nine transactions around the world in which they made billions and billions of pounds in profit. And the extraordinary thing was when they settled with the company, they included as a legal clause in that settlement that the serious fraud office would not allege corruption against the company or any of its subsidiaries or any of its agents in any of those eight or nine corrupt transactions. So this meant that effectively the serious fraud office refused to cooperate with South African prosecutors, with Austrian prosecutors, with Czech Republic prosecutors, etc., etc. So the, the limits on international cooperation are profound. And because these companies tend to be large multinational corporations, this makes it even more difficult to actually take action against them. But I think what we're seeing is something of a sea change in attitudes to these companies. So, for instance, over the years that I've been doing this work, there is much, much more in the public domain about these dastardly deals than there was 16 years ago when I was trying to deal with this in Parliament. Um, I also think that the public's appetite for the rampant corruption of these companies and politicians is running thin. 
And so one is seeing far more outrage about these sorts of things and, interestingly, seeing far more protests around the world against defense companies, against arms fairs, where they market their wares to the world. Let, let me suggest to you that the appetite might be there, but given the complex nature of many of these relationships, it is incredibly difficult and dense to try and investigate. <laughs> that is then predicated on having the right people to do that. Again, certainly in South Africa, I would suggest to you that that is a skill that is scarcely lacking. Yeah, I think that's probably correct. Look, there are not many people around the world who investigate corruption and global arms deals. Um, I mean, it's something that we specialize in, but we're a tiny organization. There are others. Um, Open Secrets in South Africa, Henny van Furen and mm. his colleagues have been doing some extraordinary work on this. Corruption Watch in South Africa has done some work on this. Um, and I think we shouldn't underemphasize the importance of investigative journalism here in exposing this wrongdoing. And I think the South African media have probably been far better than many medias in other parts of the world, including the United Kingdom, at actually getting to grips with some of these deals and the corruption involved in them, and then communicating them to the broader population in fairly accessible ways. And I think part of the challenge for, for all of us is to find different and innovative ways to do this. So we do it sometimes through books, through film, through social media, and I think we have a responsibility to be as accessible as we possibly can and to engage with people around the country in as accessible and interesting a way as we can. Just a final question. How much hope, Andrew Feinstein, are you holding out that more light is going to be thrown on corrupt practice and particularly around the arms deal now that uh, Jacob Zuma is uh, facing formal charges? I think unless some sort of backroom deal is done, it is inevitable that the charging of Jacob Zuma will result in a lot more information coming into the public domain. The reality is that we know an extraordinary amount of what happened in the South African arms deal. And you can see some of it on an excellent website developed by the civil society organization Right to Know, armsdealfacts.com. We know a lot. But I think a situation where Jacob Zuma is actually on the stand, he will be asked very tough questions. I think there is also the possibility that to try and protect himself, either through a deal with prosecutors or on the stand, he might, as he has threatened to do for years and years now, he might actually reveal information about other aspects of the deal, um, because he was only involved in one of the subcontracts and there were five major contracts and multiple subcontracts. So I think that we are likely over the next year, year and a half in South Africa to see a lot more of the real dirt on this um, arms deal that, of course, marked the point at which the ANC and our young democracy lost its moral compass. I think we are going to see far more of the dirty details. Former South African politician, whistleblower Andrew Feinstein, thank you very much indeed.